this issue over absentee ballots. In 1862, a law was passed to allow soldiers fighting in the Civil War to vote by absentee ballot. Now, there can be no dispute about the validity of the reason offered to vote by absentee ballot. But the Connecticut Supreme Court said, no matter how well-meaning that statute may be, it's unconstitutional. Because the Constitution is what expresses the supreme will of the people. Our government can only act in accordance with the Constitution. And if there's going to be a change, it has to come from the electorate. Mr. Doss, this is a question from Justice Ecker. Uh, thank you, Chief. Um, just to be clear on where we are in your argument, uh, Mr. Doss, uh, I, I understand you to be arguing the essentially the, the, the constitutional point, um, the meaning of uh, unable to appear uh, because of sickness, uh, not your separation of powers uh, argument. Is that, is that where you are? Yeah, yes, Your Honor. We think the, the, the most important thing here is the declaration. What's before this court primarily is Judge McCausher's declaration about what the meaning of Article 6, Section 7 means. Does sickness require application to the individual voter or does it apply to the existence of COVID-19 in general? So if I may just follow up, just because uh, what I'd like to do is, if I can do it quickly uh, and efficiently, is just clear out the underbrush, if you will. Um, is, it, is it accurate to say that as a practical matter, um, the separation of powers argument that you made uh, more or less has been put to rest by the ratification um, uh, by the legislature uh, in 602, uh, House Bill 602, uh, so that really what we are focused on here uh, at this point is what the words of the uh, Article 6, Section 7 mean. I, I agree with that latter portion that Article 6, Section 7 is really dispositive of this case, the meaning of sickness. Um, I, but I would say that the new legislation doesn't affect the ability of the court to reach that issue uh, for a number of reasons. Um, the first is that we still have a live controversy. Whether that live controversy is about what Judge McCausher determined about the meaning of the Constitution, that's live. Whether that live controversy is about whether the secretary's applications when they were issued was constitutional, that's live. And and finally, I'd note, and we put it in our briefs, that the ratification itself was not constitutional if you follow the argument that was successfully made by the defendant in the 9323 action. But Justice Ecker, to your point, really the sum and substance of this appeal, no matter how we slice it, is going to be can an individual, uh, uh, does sickness in the in Article 6, Section 7 uh, apply to the individual or does it apply to the general existence of COVID? Okay, Mr. Doss, uh, I'm interested in your, your 923 argument about this court, about my um, acting as the court and making a ruling concerning um, primary um, primaries versus elections. The court never reached the issue that you are talking about, did I? The, the court determined in the, in the, in the published decision um, that the argument that was raised by the defendant, and we've reproduced on pages 12 and 13 of our reply brief, um, because there was a choice of candidates as a, a post uh, uh, for, for, uh, for in the primary as opposed to a choice of individuals to serve in the public office, that was the distinction between the primary and the election. And for that reason, they had completely different meaning. Of course, the state constitution uses effectively the same language that 93 the, the distinction that was argued uh in 9323 but that didn't approach the, that didn't touch the statutory scheme that was set up for appeals of primaries and elections did it i believe the court concluded in in the decision that it was following the argument that was made by the secretary of state the that it was very clear that it was a statutory scheme that was set up for primaries and elections and that the plaintiff was required to follow a certain statutory scheme that didn't deal with interpretation of the Constitution at all. You're exactly right, Your Honor. Uh, the uh, what we are submitting is that the argument that was presented by the defendant would be no different. Uh, we don't even have to change a word of the argument that they presented. But Your Honor is correct. It was a, the, the, there is a distinction between the interpretation of the statute and the interpretation of the statutory scheme. The court did not opine on the constitutional scheme. Our position is that 
we just can cut and paste the defendant's argument and make the exact same one with respect to the constitutional scheme. Understood. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. And I think, Your Honor, as, as it comes down to Judge McCausher's decision um, about Article 6, Section 7 applying to something beyond the tied to the individual voter, I think that's really resolved by the Secretary of State's comments before the legislature in 2012. The Secretary of State conceded to the legislature that the meaning of sickness, as it appears in Article 6, Section 7, applies to the individual. And Does the court ever opine on that issue? No, you're right. the Secretary of State said. Uh, there are two questions, I, and I'm sorry, I don't know which order it was, uh, Justice Mullins or Justice Kahn, whichever was. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just uh, jump in. I, I was curious, Attorney Das, um, about those comments and uh, whether you believe we're we're bound by those comments um, that the secretary made, and why, if you do, if you think we are. Yeah, I, I, as far as being a, a binding authority on this court, no. As far as a tool of construction for how to interpret the what the legislature did and the meaning of the constitutional provision, yes. Um, and in Republican Party versus Merrill, this court expressly said we can look particularly at this chief elections officer's explanation for legislation to determine why the legislature did what it did. But they, th those bills didn't pass, right? Actually, that's what's unique about this, uh, Justice Mullins. They did because they were resolutions presented to the legislature and the legislature approved those resolutions. Now, what didn't pass was when the elector rejected it. But if you look at what the Secretary of State did, the Secretary of State convinced the legislature to say, you need to amend this constitution because we need to broaden sickness beyond the individual, tying it to the individual. We want to broaden it and the language she used to someone who's providing care for someone who's sick. She used that specific example. And so once the legislature relied on it and approved it by majority vote through two legislative sessions, that was the reliance and Republican Party versus Merrill says that's appropriate to consider. Does, does it matter in any way that that was uh, several years ago and uh, maybe time, um, <clears throat> certainly circumstances have changed. Uh, time has passed. Um, it, could the secretary be permitted to, to take a different view? Um, so the, it. it and, and Your Honor, to be very clear, we're not relying just on the secretary's arguments from an estoppel standpoint. The legislature relied on those representations. And what that does is it tells us that the legislature put to the electorate in 2014 a question, should we amend the Constitution? And they relied on the representations of the chief elections official. They relied on the representations a year later of, of the League of Women Voters. There was no contrary pr testimony presented. And so none of that changes what happened with the legislature. They put that question out to the electorate and the electorate rejected it. So that is evidence when we look at what's the meaning of Article 6, Section 7 that this court is allowed to consider. It's one of the tools of construction in this particular place. It's a very telling one because all the, the branches of the government acted in unison on it. And the only thing that happened is the electorate said no. So we know what the original will of the people is. That's what's different. The only thing different about the 1862 case about the Civil War, what there what the Supreme Court was saying, you need to defer to the electorate and the electorate gave you this constitutional provision. But if you want them to change it, go ahead and have them changed it. And what happened right after the Supreme Court declared that law to be unconstitutional, the electorate changed the constitution. Here, you have the secretary and the League of Women Voters going to the ele legislature and saying, change the constitutional restriction. It's too restrictive. It only allows individuals who are sick and that sickness is tied to their individual circumstances. That's the testimony that presented and the reason for the change. The legislature agreed. So they did adopt it and they passed two resolutions. It went to the electorate. The electorate rejected it by 40,000 votes. Attorney we can't Doss, substitute there's, that. There's a question from Justice Kahn. Yes, John. Uh, uh, Attorney Doss, I... Um wanted to give you a chance to answer that, but I, I think you were going over some of the points you had made earlier. So I want to get back to the word sickness. Um, that word is in the Constitution, correct? Correct, Your Honor. All right. So if somebody had COVID, 
let me give you a hypothetical. If somebody had COVID and wanted an absentee ballot, they would, in your view, qualify as having a sickness, correct? The, that's not, I will be very, yes, and I would be very clear that's only part of the test. But they would qualify as having a sickness that would warrant an absentee ballot. That's where I would disagree, Your Honor. And the reason Why? I would just yes, Your Honor, because the 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 language in the Constitution is unable to appear because of sickness. So if the individual is able to appear, then they would absolutely with then they they wouldn't qualify for an absentee ballot absent a constitutional change. But now, you're tying you're tying ability to appear to a physical ability to appear, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. What do we do with people that have religious religious tenants that prevent they can walk to a polling place? It's just their religious beliefs prevent them. So aren't you reading unable to uh, go to a voting place too broadly? Uh, no, or too narrowly, too narrowly, I should say. Yeah, uh, no, your honor. Physical ability. So how do we, if, if you're right, that unable to to uh, vote in person means they can walk, even sick with COVID, risk infecting everyone, they can walk to a polling place. If that means an ability to walk, even if they may have 105 degree temperature, uh, then what do we do with with the uh, part of the uh, the the words that say inability, unable to vote because of a religious tenant? Yeah, and I think the, the the answer to that is because the constitutional provision. And keep in mind, prior to 1963, the answer is they wouldn't be able to. With the addition of the religious tenants element, the court, the uh, the the legislature and the electorate, more importantly, has already defined that as an inability to appear. But what we have done, and if you look at our reply brief in particular, how, how have they defined that as an inability to appear unless that's how you interpret the words in that way? Yes, Your Honor, because there is absolutely no other way to interpret it. I mean, that's really the the answer. If someone has is unable to appear because of their religious tenants, that means their religious tenants are were prohibiting them from appearing. But if you have a sickness that makes it unable for you to appear, then you would be unable to appear just under the Constitution. Justice Khan, to put it in the COVID. What context. about what about somebody with physical disabilities? They're in a wheelchair. They can go, but yeah. it's easier for them not to and to vote well, via absentee ballot. And, and is, I is your same, let me finish the question, is your same inability to appear the same? Unable no, Honor, to appear? Yes, yeah, it, it is from this Definition. standpoint, Your Honor. It is because I, I it, the question is what the individual voter believes they will be unable to appear based on a sickness, based on a religious tenant, based on a physical disability. That individual assessment has to be made at the voter stage. And so the voter makes that determination. What we have here and the problem with what we're looking at, and we start with the application, is to say every voter can vote in, uh, by absentee ballot because of COVID. But what if, uh, my last question, then I'm an 80 year old voter, I'm at high risk. And now I've made the decision two days before voting day, I'm not, or in this case, whenever the notice came out, that you know what, it's too risky for me to go to a voting poll. I'm 80 years old. I have a, a condition, it's in a suppressed immune system that's due to my age. I am unable to go. I can physically walk there, but I'm unable to go because of this. What you're saying is that elderly people who have immune systems that are suppressed uh, are not protected. I actually, we're saying the opposite, Your Honor. That's exact. That person that you just, just what you just described, that person would be able to appear, because it's their sickness, the 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 condition that they have, that's making it unable. And that's why I come back to COVID nineteen so, doesn't. So wait, now you're confusing me. Are you saying that if I'm an eighty year old voter and I have a suppressed immune system, I'm able to make that decision and say I'm going to stay home because of of my risk of COVID? Yes, Your Honor, and I want to be very clear about this. The, the, the rhetoric we hear from the other side is people are being asked to choose between their health and voting and nothing's further from the truth. If someone genuinely has the inability to appear and vote because of their health conditions and because of COVID, that individual can vote by absentee ballot. But, but, that but I'm now, let, let, me, let me just stop you for a second. I thought you said five minutes ago 
that somebody who had active COVID would still not qualify if they could physically walk to the polling place with 105 degree fever, as long as they could physically get there. So I'm confused. Are you changing your position? No, I, I, Your Honor, I think you summarized our position. We certainly didn't say that. We've constantly, and even in our briefs, used that example that an individual who had health conditions that restricted the ability for them to appear because of COVID would be able to appear by absentee ballot. Maybe the con underlying condition didn't allow them to vote last year, but it does this year. And they've been able to do so since 1933. I believe. I, yes, Your Honor. Where, where would that line be? Um, COVID, this particular disease, if you have certain comorbidities, um, are all those comorbidities sicknesses? Your Honor, I think that's for the individual voter to determine. So and hang, I, hang on, hang on. No, I, I, I want you to answer the question. Um, mm -hmm. Let's let's say that you know, one of the comorbidities, one of the known comorbidities, is a person with blood type A. So would blood type A be a sickness under the Constitution? If if the person, and what I would answer is, the, our Constitution allows individuals to make a determination if the combination of their health circumstances are going to be affected by The Constitution by COVID. says sickness, and I want to know how you are defining sickness. Uh, is, uh, yep. is, it's, it's, a, it's a yes or no question, I think. And, and, and is, if yeah. you have blood type A, it, would that be a sickness where a person can say, that I have a sickness and therefore I want an absentee ballot. I think again, it would be the combination of the health personal health conditions and COVID-19. That's why I come back well, the to the personal say, health condition that I'm asking about is blood yes. type A and, and nothing else. You have yep. blood type A and that's it. And your honor, again, without being able to set there, I don't think we have blanket rules on this. It's an individual determination that has to be made. And that's what the Texas Supreme Court said. Everyone needs to evaluate their individual Texas, health Texas circumstances. Texas has a different constitution and statutory construction and uh, circumstance that we have. I, I understand the Texas case, um, but that's a different situation. What I'm trying to drill down on here is what is the definition of sickness? Because I think that is the crux of what's going on here. Um, whether a person can say, um, because I fear COVID, um, they can check the box and not commit a fraud. Yeah, Your Honor, I guess that's the point. If it's just I fear COVID for the sake of fearing COVID, then I don't think that person would qualify. But if they fear it for person because of their personal health, if that I, person would okay, be able to check it off. But, but, but personal health is not a substitute for sickness. And that's that's what I'm trying to to understand. And I'm, I'm really trying to just understand that because mm -hmm. um, I think there are two slightly different issues here. One is what is sickness? And one is um, if I if a person sort of this general thing that if you fear sickness, then um, you can't check this box or the box can't be there, actually. Yeah, and let's be very clear, uh, uh, Chief Justice Robinson, the, the 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 rule that the secretary has issued wasn't you fear COVID. It's I don't want I COVID allows me to check everybody off. So even if they could appear and it's just inconvenient, they get to vote by absentee ballot. And that's really the, the main substance well, of why they if I had the sniffles and I really felt that I wasn't able to go because of the illness of sniffles mm -hmm. um, or I have sniffles, I might have COVID. Um, you know, you're supposed to uh, quarantine yourself, right? And so you, you may be sick, you don't know, you wanna check the box. What about that circumstance? And, and the answer is- Is, is are, that person are, sick? I would say the that they, they would, Ha if they believed in good faith they could check off illness, then they would be able to get an absentee ballot. And that's been the rule since 1933. Okay, and I don't so see that almost, as any So almost anything would fall under sickness that an individual said, hey, because I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how you'd even be able to challenge it anyway. Mm -hmm. But if a person said, you know, uh, there's, there's no box, COVID box, the person checks sickness because, well, quite frankly, they're afraid of COVID. You can't really challenge that, can you? No, Your Honor, and that's, part, and, and that's kind of one of the issues we have with the secretary using these circumstances to broaden the expansion of who can vote by absentee ballot by just saying everyone can, because it that is sounds a rather It sounds rather mechanical, and um, you know, I know this isn't one of those situations, but it's, it's almost like exalting form over substance. 
Uh, yeah, it's not absorbing form over substance because it's complying with the Constitution. The Constitution no, I, I provides it. I, I, I understand that. But, and, and that's a significant distinction because what we can't do is use absentee voting to expand it to everybody because the Constitution puts that restriction in place. The elector has already done so. I realize I'm running uh, a little bit out of time, and I know Justice Ecker has a question. I, one, one more question. Um, Justice Ecker, actually, you can go first, and then I have one more question for Mr. Doss. And then uh, Justice Mullins. I was just wondering, in terms of constitutional interpretation, Mr. Das, um, do you have any contemporaneous or other evidence about what sickness means? You know, the, the trial court makes a nice point um, that it doesn't say his or her. It doesn't say their uh, sickness. Um, it says sickness, uh, um, and sickness can mean pandemic or plague or polio or f Spanish flu or all these. We don't know what the legislature had in mind, at least I don't. And I'm wondering if, if you have any way to help us through the usual rules of constitutional interpretation to know whether you're right or whether the trial court was right. Yes, Your Honor, and the answer is the entire statutory scheme going from 1933 to 2012. What's, when One of the rules, and you used it in Republican Party versus Merrill, is to look at how the legislature used the same words. So if you look at the language from 1933, it says because of sickness or physical disability. That in 2012 changes to his or her illness. But every single change where we added the modifier in 1986, his, and we added the modifier his or her in 2012 were technical revisions, which meant the meaning of the language going back to 1933 when this contemporaneously was added in response to the Constitution has the exact same meaning it has today. And well, we, I mean, it may tell us something about what the uh, uh, legislature uh, believed the, the language meant at some point or what the legislature believed was a, a narrower construction uh, because it didn't want to go to the constitutional limits. But I'm wondering just about, for example, in the um, uh, in any of the legislative history relating to the enact into the uh, passage of the resolution itself, mm -hmm. um, or you know uh, any other kind of his historical basis that you can help us with. Um, that's used in other cases, you know, when you're interpreting the um, Second Amendment, for example. Uh, do you have anything that can help us other than what you just named? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, I see my time's expired. May I have a moment to answer the question? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I give you uh, two sources, Your Honor. First, I'd start off with the very first hearing that was held on this in 1929 to determine why we added sickness into the Constitution. And the examples that were given, because three things were added in, 19, in 1932 based on the 1929 hearing, out of state, sickness, physical disability. And two of those examples that were given, that were testified to, were individuals who were sick or physically disabled. Flash forward, 2012. The next time the court had an attempt to constitute to amend this constitution, they well. Let me interrupt you there, though, Mr. Das. What about just being out of out of the jurisdiction because you're, you know, I have to be in East Haven all day because my friend is having a pool party, on uh, you know in November, which is unusual, and I want to I want to make the most out of it. So um, I'm going to get there at, at before the polls open and I'm going to stay there until after they close because I love to swim in November. That's a perfectly legitimate constitutional reason to, to vote by absentee ballot, right? That's correct, Your Honor. Yeah. So it's not really, I mean, it is, it doesn't that suggest that it's not really such a restrictive and extreme um, requirement as you're suggesting? I mean, if if it's if it's that liberal uh, in a in 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 that context, then how can it be so strict in a context right next door? And your honor, I think the answer is that that the le the the electorate has chosen which categories individuals will be able to vote on, and they're not looking at the reason when you're out of the jurisdiction. But let me respond to that very quickly by noting. But I mean, that's the question, Mr. Das. Right? Is what did the electorate mean? So it doesn't it doesn't help us to say, well, it's because of what the electorate meant. Well, here's a quick answer to that, Your Honor. 
the U.S. Supreme Court addressed in McDonald versus Federal Elections of Chicago 1969, footnote eight, a number of very valid reasons that people should be able to vote by absentee ballot, but under Illinois law, they weren't allowed to. One of the best examples was a, a, a medical doctor who had to perform medical services outside his, uh, you know, but was going to be in town for a portion of it. So he wasn't he wasn't going to be entitled to vote by absentee ballot. There are a number of very good reasons why people should be able to vote by absentee ballot, but the electorate has defined that. And Justice Ecker, they did answer that question in 2014, not just because they said that we're not going to expand absentee ballot voting, but both legislatures that passed it, 2012, 2013, did it in response to this very question. And so if the electorate was going to agree with the legislature, they would have adopted those amendments. And I realize my time is up, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you, Mr. Doss. I believe there are two justices and myself who still have some questions. Oh. Uh, Justice Mullins. Uh, I, I'll ask it. Why not? Uh, I just was listening to the earlier conversation and uh, was curious about your take on, um, I guess, two things. Why our view of sickness in the Constitution our interpretation of it um, shouldn't include sort of a, a like a public health kind of concern um, and a kind of holistic view of what sickness should mean. And tied to that, um, I was thinking about listening to the conversation with the Chief Justice, uh, anxiety. Anxiety itself, um, I think, can be a sickness. Right. And anxiety can prevent you from going to the polls. So you could be a person in today's society with COVID and its effects um, and have real anxiety about going to a polling place where there are going to be a number of other people. We have the governor. We have all of our health professionals telling us to, you know, social distance and stay home and do our part to to do that in this in this age. Um, can't that create anxiety? And why wouldn't that be a sickness that could fit in? Maybe you could check the regular box of sickness, but why couldn't you check the COVID box? Why wouldn't this fit? Sure. Uh, let me I'll, I'll address all three questions in order, if I may. Um, let me start with the first question, which is why you shouldn't give it a broad rating. And the answer is because it's an exception to the rule. Default rule is you're not able to vote by absentee voting. That's been the jurisprudence recognized by this court in the cases as recently as Keeley. That's been the application by the State Elections Enforcement Commission, which is in charge with, with, with adjudicating this principle. So that's the default rule is you can't vote by absentee ballot unless you fit one of the exceptions. With respect to your anxiety example, uh, Justice Mullins, Again, we're coming back to individual decisions about whether someone fits within the illness box. And the what we have here, and that's what's different than what we have that's been presented by the secretary here, is an expansion to say everyone can vote uh, by absentee ballot. That's the problem. It has to be narrowly tailored to each individual to make that decision. And that's what Texas said, and that's why we're asking for, for that principle to be followed. Where The hardest thing that the state has in defending their position is they have to argue the extreme. They have to argue that every single voter in Connecticut can vote by absentee ballot. The questions you're presenting us with are the exceptions. And the, on the exceptions are taken on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think through the court's questions about how does that get enforced, the answer is our own moral convictions. We trust the voters to make a determination of whether they fit one of those boxes or not. The problem we have here is the secretary informed every single voter in Connecticut, hey, don't worry about your individualized ability to appear at the poll. Every single voter can vote by absentee ballot now that we have COVID-19. And that's unconstitutional because it goes well beyond what the Constitution provided in 1932 when the provision was enacted and it goes well beyond what was provided in in 2012 which is exactly why this question was sent to the electorate and it was rejected in 2014. Can I just uh, try to uh, just a little bit differently I, maybe maybe I'm understanding it wrong but the I don't know that it includes necessarily includes every person. I mean, the, the language does, but the reason I asked about anxiety is because, uh, you know, to some extent, maybe all of us are experiencing some anxiety, uh, but some of us will check the box and some of us won't, just like those who have a sickness that 
we could agree qualifies as a sickness. Uh, maybe no two people will treat that the same way. Some people will say, I, I want to get up and go, and others will, will say, I won't. Um, so that's why I was curious about anxiety, because it's something this this pandemic kind of affects us all in one way or another. And this category um, seems to be a way to allow people who feel anxiety or if you know, if you'll indulge me, call that a sickness, to be able to check that box without committing fraud. But you could experience the same thing and have the same feelings and have the personal decision that you you can go to the poll. You want to go. I'm not sure why that doesn't, why that shouldn't be our interpretation of this constitutional provision. And, and Your Honor, when I come back to that is say what exactly what the issue Judge McCausher teed up is. Does sickness tie to the individual, or is it just the mere existence of a particular uh, issue, a pandemic, sickness? So the existence of anxiety, for example, Justice Mullins, wouldn't mean that every single person gets to go out and vote by absentee ballot. Maybe the fact that you're conscious about the fact that other people are going to be uncomfortable with people being out there because of anxiety. Maybe someone, but an individual who's really uncomfortable with going because they have anxiety um, would be able to vote by illness. We don't require doctor's notes. They make that individual assessment. The problem here is to say that everyone can vote because of COVID, even though you can, you know, participate in a rally, you can go to Home Depot, you can go to the Walmart, and Mr. yet Mr. you Dass, still get to vote. It, 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 just a moment, may I? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the problem that I'm having with that argument is you're saying, your argument is that this allows everyone to file absentee ballots. Isn't it really limited to those who want to check that COVID box? It says, if you check this box, the, the secretary's order, if you check this box, you cannot be prosecuted for committing a fraud. You can choose not to check the box, but how would a person who is suffering from this, uh, to use Justice Mullen's terms, anxiety, know that they could check, they could, they don't have to check the sickness box, that anxiety is actually covered by this provision? How would they know that? So in the explanatory text in the application, it was advised that if the illness your, your inability to appear was because of an underlying condition to to touch on Justice Khan's example or something that your personal conditions with respect to anxiety uh, are going to touch are related to COVID, you would check the illness box. COVID, the COVID box was created as a broader blanket rule. And that's the problem. Since 1933, you has, could- Has, has the secretary, um, is there an agreement that that's the, what the secretary was saying? It's it's cited in the application, Your Honor. It's it's quoted in the application. The the distinction between checking illness and checking COVID nineteen was just the distinction that you just mentioned. If you if your personal health circumstances mean that you can't that you can't go to the polls, you check you check illness, even if it's COVID related. Right. But if it's anything else, you check COVID. It was a creation of a brand new area that is what the problem is. No, I think you're conflating some things that I'm, at least maybe I'm conflating some things. Um, if you feel that you don't want to go out to the polls, you have this anxiety. Um, I, I guess your argument really is that, that anxiety would have to rise to the level of a sickness. And the problem that I'm having with that is now we're telling people what sicknesses are included, what sicknesses aren't. And the Constitution doesn't do that. Yeah, Your Honor, I, I don't think we're telling people that. I think what we're telling people, if you are unable to appear at the polls because of sickness, as you interpret that phrase, you would be I'm able not interpreting to, the phrase. I'm saying I, that that's what I'm trying to figure out how to interpret the phrase. No, the, the individual would. I mean, and, and that's what Texas says. Let the individual make that in determination. Don't give a broad, bland, bland statement, which is what the secretary did here, saying everyone gets to vote by COVID because that's not accurate. The Constitution allows it to be individualized. Okay, I'm not trying to cut you off. I'm just trying, trying to get through a lot, um, and we're already over time. Um, can reasonable jurists disagree with what you're saying? I, on an, I don't think on the basic constitutional provision about whether everyone can vote by absentee ballot. No, no, could disagree. whether this whole ang we're sort of going around in circles on anxiety and illness and all these other things. And I'm getting twisted in knots and I'm trying to figure out if we're getting this twisted around, can reasonable jurists disagree on this issue? 
I, I'd even go further and say reasonable people could disagree on their individual circumstances, which is why we entrust the voters to make that individual determination. And we have since 1930. That, that's not answering my question. My, my, my question is, can reasonable people disagree about the interpretation of sickness? Reasonable jurists. Yes, I think they. It's, and it's can reasonable past, jurists uh, disagree uh, on how to how this issue um, presents itself in this case? Yes, if and I will okay. say no because right. if I could answer that two prong, Your Honor. <laughs> Um, no, because I think under the plain meaning and the dictionary definitions we provided of unable to appear because of sickness. I think individuals can disagree about their personal circumstances, and that's why we don't second guess that. But most importantly, I think if you do disagree, if reasonable jurists can disagree, then you have to look at the other tools of construction, and every one of them falls in our favor. Well, I, th I think you see which direction I'm going in, which is what standard do we review the governor's order by, um, as well as the secretary's order? Um, as far as the constitutionality of, of those orders are concerned, not, well, and, not the secretary's yep. order, the secretary's interpretation. And the answer is because it's a constitutional provision, the most authoritative source is the Connecticut Supreme Court, Marbury versus Madison. You don't have any deference to the other branches of government when it comes to interpreting the meaning of our Connecticut Constitution. And in order, but the act itself of the secretary and of the governor, are, are those by reasonable uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, how do we how do we look at those? How do yeah. we review those? So I I guess I and let me let me square up to come back to what Justice Acker asked from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. The issue before this court, because of the way this has been procedurally set up, is the declaration that Judge McCausher issued. The only legal question before this court is: Does sickness under the Constitution apply to the individual or the existence of COVID? Everything else, Your Honor, that comes from that whether it's injunctive relief, the remedy, everything else, the review of, of actions of, of the secretary and, 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 the, um, and, and the governor, they all come secondary to that declaration. But because we're here on a 5229 and not some other proceeding, all those would be remanded back and we'd have consideration on what that remedy might be. All right, I have two more quick questions for you. Um, the Purcell Doctrine, I, I haven't heard you mention that yet. Um, the primary is August 11th, which is Tuesday. Um, why why should we or should we not invoke the Purcell Doctrine? Yeah, uh, two reasons. Obviously, I'll start with the most basic is Purcell Doctrine is a federal rule uh, and not one binding on state courts. But let me jump to the more significant issue, which is that, again, the only thing before this court is the declaration. What does Article 6, Section 7 apply? The application of that to the primary or to the general election is something that the trial court may address on remand or in a subsequent proceeding. That declaration. But how do you how do you do that without interfering in the election itself, which occurs Tuesday? Well, I think the court would uh, when this gets remanded, uh, the court would then have to evaluate the factors and that comes into the balancing of equities. Is this something that would be reasonable for the court to intervene in with the benefit of the declaration? It may be come up in a post uh, election challenge. It may come up in a pre elect uh, uh, post primary challenge. It may come up in a pre election challenge. The declaration is the important thing because that's what already was issued. That's the but, only thing you're reviewing. But still. Um you were saying that wouldn't have any uh, wouldn't affect the elect uh, the primary in any way possibly at this point it would depend on the judge uh, trial judge to make a determination of whether injunctive relief would be available Purcell may be considered before Tuesday before and the court Tuesday. may say so this court have to make its decision it would have to get down there and then have to do all this before Tuesday um, preferably early Monday or Friday it's and, two business days left and and Mr. Chief Justice, even if that were not the case and we didn't have that declaration, mm -hmm. when we have the benefit of that declaration, because keep in mind, there's no injunctive relief before this court, the court could allow it to go forward and get that declaration. Perhaps a primary challenge is available. Perhaps and we have, we have well, guided. You mentioned that. What, what would happen? Um, we didn't deal with the agreement issue um, yet, and I, I don't think we're going to have time to, we have it in your briefs. Um, but the Dem nobody from the Democratic primary are members of, of the, uh, our parties in this case, right? Well, they filed an amicus brief, so they, they are filed a party. an amicus, but that's it. They don't have a, a representative to argue at this court uh, mm -hmm. or at the trial court. 
Right. And and the answer so and the answer you, is you could actually end up with a sort of bizarre situation where you can get injunctive relief in the Republican primary, but maybe not the Democratic primary. Well, so your honor, we don't know what we could get for terms of no, injunctive. I, I don't know. I'm just saying that could right. be one of the things could I, happen. And that would be something for the trial court to determine. What I will say about the declaratory relief, and this is significant, because once this court declares in our hope that Article 6, Section 7 applies to the individual, then the value of that declaration is that it could be applied by the Republicans or the Democrats in a, cha- election, a post-primary challenge or in an action related to what might happen with the general election. But that declaration is what's guiding it. And keep in mind, Chief Justice Robinson, this is the only way to address that. Because as your, your honor made clear in the 9323 action, this issue couldn't be raised in that action. So we'd all have the benefit of this legal determination that Judge McCaffrey's have, already ruled on. But you could have filed the proper action timely. I mean, that's the that's the latches argument that we don't have time to get into right now. But which la- last one to ask is is about the Geisler factors. Um, is the decision of the legislature to pass the bill that they passed? Can that be used as one of the Geisler factors? In in I guess which factor would your honor think it would uh, come uh, under? Right? Social policy. I I. Th- from a constitutional standpoint, I don't think so because of the because we're only dealing again with the declaration and they weren't opining on the constitutionality. I think the Geisler's factors most contemporary recent uh, uh, issue with respect to interpreting the constitutional provision has to be has to be the 1912 uh, 2012 amendment because that was what was directed at the Constitution. If there had been a constitutional amendment proposed this time around uh, in, in the most recent legislation, then perhaps. Have but we ever because- cabin the, have we ever cabin the social policy factor to be like you're stating now that seems rather bizarre that um, it would have to be that the legislature would say explicitly say we're dealing with the constitutionality of this issue and therefore the pol- social policy is this because of the constitutionality of this issue I, you know I, yeah, and unusual. I well, it is, but we have an unusual set of circumstances where, you know, this this case was briefed last week and the new legislation we're dealing with on, on July 31st without any hearings and without any public testimony, without all of the reliable factors we had when we were dealing with a change in the Constitution, which, to be very clear, was not the issue or even considered in the most recent legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Das. Um, I'm sorry for asking so many questions. And no, thank you. I appreciate it. So them, long, but um, I appreciate your answers. Um, for the appellee, um, um, we will give. I'll give you additional time um, to to work with this. Right now, we'll stick with the, the thirty and then see how that works out. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. I'm Assistant Attorney General Michael Scold, and I represent the Secretary of the State in this appeal. Your Honors, the executive order that plaintiffs seek to challenge in this case is a common sense and necessary health and safety measure that is designed to save lives and ensure that every Connecticut voter can safely exercise their fundamental right to vote. Yes, hold on one second. Did we completely lose Mr. Das or did he just turn his video off? Mr. Das, are you there? I just want to make sure we didn't lose you. (laughs) Sorry, counsel. Please continue. Uh, It is a necessary health health and safety measure designed to save lives and ensure that every Connecticut voter can safely and effectively exercise their fundamental right to vote during the August primaries without the risk of spreading or contracting the disease of COVID-19. And although initially issued by the governor, the executive order has since received the near unanimous support of the entire General Assembly, which voted overwhelmingly and on a bipartisan basis to not only ratify the executive order for the general or the uh, primaries in August, but yes, Your Honor. I, I uh, want to try to get in here before I don't have a chance. Uh, I, I understand that part of your argument. I'm curious uh, if you could if you could connect that to how we should interpret the term sickness, because whatever the merit of uh, the reasonableness of come of the uh, governor's executive order uh, to protect public safety, um, whatever the merit of that, how does that relate to an interpretation of what those words mean in the statute? If, if you could connect that, because I, I could see maybe they do, but there's at least a plausible argument that the words mean what they mean. And however that shakes out is how it shakes out. 
Absolutely, Your Honor. And, and to do that, Your Honor would have to go to the Geisler factors, the first one of which is the text, which the trial court determined was clear and dispositive, and the Secretary agrees with that. The, the Constitution provides that individuals can vote by absentee ballot if they're unable to appear because of sickness. And those are the only three words that the Constitution uses, and that's a, a broad authorization for absentee voting. And if you just look at the text, but there's only it's two. not clear. The text, you would you say the text is clear and unambiguous, or or is it ambiguous? Well, I think certainly the trial court found it to be clear and unambiguous, and and I, I do think it's unambiguous when you look at the the text, especially in relation to the other language for other reasons in the constitutional provision, for sickness and for physical disability. The uh, the framers said because of sickness, and and the. So there's two requirements. One is there must be a sickness, and then there's the unable to appear because of it. With regard to the sickness, the legis the framers uh, did not identify who that has to have that sickness. They did not identify an object to whom that sickness must apply. They just said sickness. And in, in contrary to the the sickness and physical physical disability examples in the Constitution, for other reasons for voting absentee in that same provision, the legis the framers did tie it specifically to the individual voter. And the most glaring example of that is the religion example. For that, the framers said that individuals can vote absentee if they're unable to appear because of their religion. It used the word there. It didn't do that for sickness or physical disability. And when they used the word there in connection right next to the word religion, they were clearly intending to express their intent that it has to be that individual's own religion that prohibits them from going to the polls. And if you apply basic principles of construction that this court applies on a regular basis, when the legislature, or in this case, the framers, use one word for one uh, example in the, in the provision, but deliberately omit that word from another related example. Yes, Your Honor, just a second. Just a second. You can fit it if if you're not done with your answer. Um, go ahead and finish. I don't want to interrupt. I, I was just raising my hand to uh, uh, indicate that I had a question when you were done. Okay. Um, so, so when they they used the word there specifically with regard to religion, but did not use it with regard to sickness and physical disability, um, that is intended to signify a difference, a different meaning. And this court has to construe the language differently when the, that word is missing. Can I just have one follow up before you you go, Justice Ecker? Um, I'm I'm just uh, so it, it seems though that sickness. Uh, I'm curious about your response to the the um, plaintiff's point that the only way to interpret the religious exemption um, is it has to be related to to your your particular religion and your particular religious belief that would uh, sort of un make you unable to appear. Sickness, um, there's there's at least, I mean, I, I think you said it was unambiguous, but there's the, you, you, you wouldn't say there's at least a reasonable view that the way sickness has been interpreted throughout the years, um, dating back to the 1800s or whenever this, whenever this provision came to be, the sickness provision, that it was believed to be your sickness, not a general sickness? I don't I just would take issue with the, the statement that that's how it's been interpreted. Nobody in Connecticut has interpreted it that way, Your Honor. Um, and in fact, uh, in other states, the Arkansas Supreme Court, the Forrest versus Baker case that we've cited in our brief, the plaintiffs totally ignore. In that case, they interpreted identical language because of illness um, and it consistent with the secretary's position to mean that it could mean somebody else's illness in the family, for example, that you're caring for. So I don't think it's true that it's been interpreted to be the individual's sickness. And with maybe, regard maybe to the court, maybe not a court, but but the secretary herself um, viewed this more narrowly uh, than I guess she does now. And, you know, we may not be bound by that, but isn't that a tool of construction we can use in interpreting this provision? Well, I, I think the first point I'd, I'd make with regard to the secretary's 2012 testimony is that the plaintiffs are mischaracterizing it. So that her testimony was in relation to a constitutional amendment to make no excuse absentee balloting. And she had a, a large amount of testimony on that. And at the end, uh, she did reference, among many other examples, things that people are not able to vote absentee ballot for, one of which was caregivers. But when she made that statement, she prefaced it with the Constitution and the laws of this state. 
That was the statement that she made in her testimony. And the laws of this state, his, uh, which was general statute section 9-135, that statute did say his or her illness. So under the statute, there's no dispute that a caregiver could not, a healthy caregiver could not vote absentee under the pre-EO version of section 9-135. But I don't think the secretary was in any way opining on the meaning of because of sickness. She was advocating for a legislative amendment to no excuse absentee balloting and she just gave one example. So I don't think her testimony informs the analysis at all. Um, Thank you. Yes. I'll ask my question to Justice Ecker. Go ahead, Chief. I I, I, uh, I can wait. Um, I want to. No, okay. Thank you. We're all too polite here, aren't we? So uh, so um, uh, so I guess your position then, uh, Mr. Scold, is uh, that the Constitution itself, apart from the statutory regime, the Constitution uh, would have allowed uh, uh, caregiving uh, as a as a as a justification for. Um, absentee voting even bef before the executive order uh, if you were taking care of an ill or elderly parent who is sick or something then under the constitution that would be uh, encompassed within um, sickness that's correct your honor I think the constitution would permit that and whether the general assembly chooses to implement that is the general assembly's choice uh, and the general general assembly through 9-135 chose not to ex implement it as broadly as that that was its, a legislative choice but it was not okay. a constitutional requirement so um i'm just i want to just uh, the other only other question i have for you at the moment is is uh, uh the same one i asked of uh attorney das i mean i i understand the geisler factors have been used in other cases even with the sort of unusual or sui generis constitutional provision you know, uh, I'm not sure the Geisler factors are terribly helpful, uh, you know, in, in a constitutional analysis uh, when we're dealing with our own with our own provision that's unlike that anywhere else. Pretty, pretty unusual. Um, so let, let's just get right at the constitutional interpretation question. I mean, normally we would be pretty interested, uh, you know, whether you're an originalist or not, you'd be pretty interested in what what was meant at the time based on historical evidence. Um, and uh, does anybody have, do you have any information that would illuminate that for us? Uh, we have looked at the, the history of the constitutional amendment from 1932, your honor, and there's, there's nothing, nothing in it that would shed light on this. I mean, I think the, the pr provision at issue was largely um, uh, didn't generate much interest at all in um, in the populace at the time. It was just kind of taken as an assumption. And as far as the debates go, I know that the plaintiffs have referenced uh, some language from one of the hearings in 1929, which we've included in our appendix, Your Honor. That does not shed any light at all. There's two comments in there from two individual legislators who were speaking. They were just giving anecdotal um examples of, of experiences in their own life that have caused them to want to support absentee balloting. It did not in any way suggest what the meaning of the full scope of this provision is. So the, the short answer is there's nothing in the history that there's nothing like. helpful. I'm just looking for other ways to do to do the uh, constitutional interpretation. Uh, you know, putting aside the, the Geisler factors, uh, the typical constitutional interpretation that we conduct uh, you know, I, I guess textualism is 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 what the trial court used. Um, do, do we know anything about whether the word contagion was popular or used at that point? I mean, I suppose I could say, well, they didn't they didn't say their sickness, but they also didn't say sickness or contagion. Um, uh, you know, uh, is is there anything else that you can give us other than sort of uh, go, you know, uh, relying back on what's reasonable for a executive to do under conditions of a pandemic? Um, well, well, that's certainly not the only thing we're relying on, Your Honor. We're relying on the text and, and how it's been interpreted. Similar text has been interpreted by, by our courts and other states. Um, but with regard to the history, no, I wish I had more for Your Honor, but there, there just isn't anything in there okay. that I'm aware of that would speak to that particular issue from from the historical perspective, um, okay. at, at least that we're aware of. 
But so so I think the, the tax Mr. Skull. It's, Mr. Skull. Oh yes. Um, just to sort of pull this thread that uh, Justice Ecker was pulling. Um, we had the the nineteen eighteen pandemic, um, which reemerged in the nineteen thirties as the nineteen thirty pandemic because the virus had mutated. The fact that we had this constitutional change after both those events, yet the language is the stat, the, the constitution didn't change. Does that mean anything to you? To me, it would suggest that those things would be included within the language, Your Honor. If that's the type of the history of what was going on at the time, that that uh, the framers would have been well aware of of those diseases being prevalent, and uh, the, their choice not to use the word there or tie it to the individual, to me. Again, going back to the text, not including the word there or his or her would suggest to me that it, they were intending a broader meaning, especially when okay. then they. So. And, and not speaking for Mr. Das, but I'm, I, I suppose his argument would be or they could have been aware of the circumstances, aware of the Constitution, which is what we, the legal presumption we use, and they didn't change it. They they intentionally didn't change it because uh, they didn't think that uh, there should be this change um, to allow more people to use absentee balloting. But that just begs the question, Your Honor, of what they, the original uh, language meant. And if there was no need to change it, then they wouldn't have changed it because it already was included within the constitutional language. And I'm not aware of anything from a court or a legislator or any other state actor around that time who would have suggested that the words because of sickness was limited in the manner that the plaintiffs are suggesting. There's no authority for that anywhere, and the plaintiffs haven't cited any. Um, and the case law is to the contrary from other states, the Arkansas case that we cite, Forrest versus Baker, um, and, and, and the, the, the Parker versus Brooks case from our superior court, which I understand is obviously not binding, but it's still persuasive authority from within this jurisdiction. Um, I hope I'm not going too far afield with this question, but uh, suppose that the, the, uh, the trial court said that the, the text was clear and unambiguous, um, and so uh, the, the tools that we use of statutory interpretation is, is basically that's what you're stuck with, that's what you have. What would happen if, despite the fact that the text was clear and unambiguous, the behavior of the of the legislature and the executive branch was such that it created an ambiguity? What what would we do then? Well, I think that would be going beyond the text. To, I mean, if the text is ambigu unambiguous, then it's unambiguous. But can it, can it, I guess what I'm asking is, can it subsequently be made ambiguous? Um, and I, I don't think we've ever dealt with that situation. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that subsequent actions by by other state actors would be enough to render the plain language of the statute ambiguous. So I would say no, Your Honor. But, but there is nothing that has happened since the initial language was passed into the Constitution to suggest that, that there was a different meaning. Now, I know the plaintiffs have, have relied on the genealogy of Section 9-135. But all that tells us is that for the 50 years after the, the constitutional provision went in, the legislature used the same language as the Constitution. And there was nothing interpreting that or anything until 1986, when an entirely different General Assembly made up of different legislators made amendments that they considered to be technical. I think the fact that, that a different General Assembly 50 years later makes technical amendments doesn't speak anything to what the framers meant when they when they applied it. And it certainly doesn't mean more than what this General Assembly meant about its understanding now. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Skoll, uh, Judge Maul has a question. Mr. Skoll, I wanted to ask you a few questions about your latches argument. Um, my understanding is that the defendant didn't file an answer below, and I assume that there was some kind of agreement that the typical pleading requirements would be suspended. Uh, there, how did, how did it come no, to pass? That, I mean, I know you argued, you know, orally a latches defense before Judge McCausher, but how did it come to be that there was no uh, answer filed by the defendant? Um, it was... Uh, there was no agreement on any of that, Your Honor. The complaint was filed, and then the next day the trial court set a hearing. Um, and, with, and at that hearing, the defendant raised an oral motion to dismiss, which the trial court denied. And then the trial court proceeded to hear the merits and decided them. So there was no opportunity to file an answer. So do you agree that Judge McCausher did no fact-finding with regard to your Lachey's defense? 
He did not do any fact finding, Your Honor. Uh, we we did raise the latches argument in the mo in the hearing, and um, asked for an opportunity if uh, to present evidence on that. We did submit two affidavits from the uh, Ted Bromley, who's the director of elections from SOTS, but the trial court found it unnecessary to address that because he dismissed it on the merits. So you've now raised latches as an alternative ground for affirmance of the judgment. So my, my question then is, are you aware of any appellate authority where either the Supreme Court or the appellate court affirmed a judgment based on a defense where the trial court had done no fact finding? Where they affirmed the judgment on the basis of that defense? Correct, which is essentially um, what you're doing here. I'm not aware of that, Your Honor. This is an extraordinary case where the, the matter was decided one day after the complaint was filed. Um, but I would say that if the court is inclined to agree with us on the latches defense, or at least think there's an issue there, then um, the court should not grant any relief on the merits of this case. And, and but but um, so, so no, the, the short answer to your question is I'm not aware of appellate authority that would permit that. OK. All right. Thank you. Just. Justice Khan. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I, I can you, hear you, Your Honor. Okay. We had to have one of those uh, moments. Uh, sorry. Uh, Justice Khan, I think you yes. may have hit the share screen button. Oh. There How is go. that? Is that better? Sorry about that. It's right next to the mute button that was on. Uh, so, uh, counsel, this question may be better uh, for Attorney Doss, but as I uh, listen to his argument, he basically, with a series of hypotheticals, indicated that his client would have no problem with someone checking off sickness if they had anxiety and were nervous to go to the polls because of COVID risk, or if somebody's 80 years old, to my particular hypothetical, and has an immune suppressed system because of age, not any particular illness, just age, and is uncomfortable, uh, doesn't want to not go to the polls because of their age, that that would fall under sickness. So I wonder if, is what we're fighting about here the form itself, because when I listen to attorney uh, Proloid Das, it would suggest that if the secretary had just amended the form to say sickness includes COVID next to the word sickness, then would we be here? Uh, you know, that's how I'm reading his argument, because what he's saying is it's that there was a, a section added for COVID. Uh, and he reads that to mean everyone can check off COVID as opposed to people making an individualized decision. But it sounds like any person who has concerns about catching COVID uh, could opt for an absentee ballot. It, I didn't hear him to say that he would have a problem with that. But maybe that's, a, in fairness, a better question for him. But it seems to me he's trying to put COVID and its risks under the term sickness, yet objects to a form that seems to sort of spell it out. Or would it be just that the secretary could give guidance, could send a memo with an absent, you know, I, I just don't, I, I wonder if is what we're fighting over forms then. Well, given his I, uh, explanation. Sorry. I, th I think I agree with you, Your Honor, that the plaintiff's argument really is just putting form over substance because the reality is that every individual voter is eligible to state on the, on the application that they are unable to appear because of the sickness of COVID-19. That doesn't mean that they have to. That's a choice that they are making because of their own um, circumstances. And I think that's exactly what you heard plaintiffs say repeatedly is that it's down to every voter. And we agree with that. Not every voter has to vote absentee ballot. If they want to go to the polls, they still can. But the reality is that this, this particular sickness, 
and the, the nature of the disease and the ease with which it spreads, the fact that there's no uh, vaccine or treatment and the deadliness of the disease is such that that, ex that excuse, that reason for voting absentee applies to every voter who feels that they are unable to appear. And to your point on the what it means to be unable to appear, Your Honor, uh, the, the other examples given in the Constitution, religion and absence from the town of voting, make very clear that it, unable to appear doesn't mean you have to be physically incapable of going. Somebody uh, could be out of town in Rhode Island, 45 minutes from their home on vacation. That person is eligible to vote absentee, not because they can't go to the polls, but because they're making a choice to be in another place. And that's what our constitution and our statutes permit the voters to make that choice. We're just extending that, the, the executive order has extended that same choice to individuals who are feel that they are unable to appear because of, of COVID-19, Your Honor. And, and, and I think that the, 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 this is confirmed by the a point that the trial court made in its decision that I found very persuasive was that the amount of people that have been killed in Connecticut during COVID-19 is 4,300. That's about the same as the total number of Connecticut residents that died during World War II, Korea, and the Vietnam War combined over 10 years. And that just goes to show the lethality of what we're dealing with here and how it is entirely appropriate and lawful and constitutional for an individual to say that I am unable to appear. I don't feel that I can go to the polls in this context. Yes, Justice Robinson. Just kind of you through with your, your question. Uh, Mr. Skoll, um, I noted during um, the last uh, hearing that I heard uh, as a justice of the court, which was uh, Fay one, um, the language is, is unusual in both the executive order and in the, the secretary's interpretation. The Constitution says sickness, um, and the executive order and the secretary's interpretation adds the article the the sickness of COVID or the sickness of COVID. Um, that's, what does that word mean, the, the T-H-E, the, the article that that's, appears there? Because, uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to put words in Mr. Das's mind, I'm trying to think of what he would say. He would say that, that adding that article and extending sickness to every one um, is unconstitutional because the Constitution doesn't say that and that sickness means the individual. I think the, they use the word the um, because saying sick, be, had they written it to say an individual can vote absentee because of sickness of COVID-19, that just doesn't make grammatical sense. I think they were putting in the to describe the sickness of, of COVID-19. Um, but the, the, I think the, the real point is that neither the, the the constitution does not have any other language in it that would tie it to the individual voter the way the general statute section 9-135 does that's really the the answer to that your honor and and it just says sickness and and we and the governor and the executive order is describing a particular sickness that is the basis for the order in this case uh, just a second I think Justice Mullins had uh, in, has has had a, had a question. Uh, I my don't know. apologies. My apologies to, to Justice Mullins. Justice Mullins. Uh, very quick, very quickly. Thank you, Justice uh, Eckert. I um, am, am just uh, curious about why it, did I did I misunderstand you that if someone felt like they were um, fearful, is the word I used earlier was anxiety about COVID nineteen. That they could, they, they could check the my illness box. No, no, they would check the the COVID nineteen box. Suppose um, there was no COVID nineteen box. Um, well, I think that gets into the the questions that that your honors were asking earlier about what does what rises to the level of a sickness, and the Constitution doesn't spe specify specify that, and which is why the sec the governor's executive order is is appropriate. Is it it makes it clear that this sickness is a sickness. It's a very lethal one, and it's the excuse for voting absentee in this context. Um, and I don't think that we have to. Well, can, I, can I just ask you for a clarification? Because I, I'm not sure without the COVID-19 box, um, it, it is at least not confusing to me that COVID-19 is a sickness. I mean, that that part is true. The issue might be 
whether that fits into unless you have it not having it and being afraid to contract it maybe that is the question of whether it fits into my illness but if there is a sickness i'm not i'm still not quite clear on exactly what a sickness is but if there is one it seems like covid-19 or the coronavirus would would be a sickness it's, I it's just agree you get to access that if you don't actually have it if it's not your sickness i guess well so that's that, that's the the reason for the executive order is 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 to address that issue of, of whether or not you have to have it the secretary of the state issued an an opinion um, interpreting Section 9-135 before the executive order was passed, um, and, and that's I don't believe that's in the the appendix in this case, but it is in the appendix in Phase One. Um, and in that opinion, the secretary opined about what my illness means, and it does include pre-existing condition, conditions like anxiety or, or what, whatever they might be that would cause someone to be to consider themselves unable to go to the polls. So if there's a if an indiv individual has a pre-existing condition uh, illness that coupled with COVID-19 would make them unable to go to the polls, even if ordinarily they wouldn't be able to, they could check the my illness box. But really, what the executive order is addressing is somebody who doesn't have an illness, but is because of the nature of this particular disease, which is a sickness, feels that they are unable to go to the polls. Okay, so that's that's the distinction between the my illness box and the COVID-19 boxes is for the COVID-19 box. You don't even you, you're the view is you don't have to have it at all. Just the Correct. fact that it's just the fact that it exists allows you to um, check that box. Right. And for the, and the reason is that because, first of all, it is a sickness and it's entirely appropriate for somebody to feel that they are unable to go to the polls because of that, given that it's a, a highly infectious disease. It, it kills a lot of people. There's no treatment. There's no all of that. OK, in terms of where to draw the line between um, what's considered a, a valid sickness for you and what's not, just just on interpreting that language of the Constitution and what is a sickness. And COVID-19 falls into that category because it's this sort of pandemic ubiquitous kind of thing. But but won't What's what's the line demarcating this from uh, being, you know, over inclusive? Um, wh where where would that line be in the in your view? Because it seems like if you could point to a sickness, um, whether we talk about the COVID-19 box or not, but just interpreting the language of the Constitution, if a sickness is enough, um, it seems like any sickness is enough. And if I'm wrong about that, where where would the line be? I think the line is not in de defining what is a sickness, um, because anxiety can be a sickness, the common cold can be a sickness. The line is whether you are unable to appear because of it. So I don't think that any person, would, uh, any voter would reasonably be able to say in good faith that I am unable to appear at the polls because of the common cold or the sniffles. Um, that's, I don't, I don't, I, be, I, I hate to cut you off, but we, we've got, We've heard, at least in this morning's argument, some pretty interesting examples of wanting to go swimming in November. Uh, if you if you want to go swimming in November and you stay uh, at your buddy's house with an open pool in November during all of the the hours, that's enough to make you unable to appear. So so if you, if you have a cold, why couldn't you just say I'm choosing not to get out of bed today? Well, the, the, there's a difference in, in the, the sickness and absent out of town is obviously there are two different examples. But I agree with you that, that um, the, the absence from the town can be a very flexible uh, off, authorization for absentee voting. And let a lot of people who are clearly capable of going to the polls vote by absentee ballot. And I don't know it would make no sense to interpret this provision of sickness more narrowly than that in a way that would require somebody to actually be unable to physically incapable of going. That would make no sense. Um, and, and so I, I think I would ag agree with what your honor is saying that this, inter this, this because of sickness language should be interpreted just as broadly um, as the other ones. Uh, I don't see why they, it wouldn't be. Just a second. Um, I'm wondering about two things uh, and they're sort of related but I'll keep them separate for, for, first I'll just 
uh, ask quickly. The there's no there's no claim here, as I understand it, of uh, an abuse of power or a partisan uh, effort, a pretextual effort by the executive branch uh, to uh, issue this ex executive order for purposes other than the public health uh, emergency that was declared. Is that is that true just as a matter of what the record uh, and pleadings show in this case? Absolutely, Ron. The, the purpose of this executive order was to protect health and safety and ensure the right to vote. But I'm, I'm just asking whether, I mean, whether whether the plaintiffs have claimed uh, no. that that's a pretext. No. Uh, so what, the first question I'll is, and, and I'll try to keep it short, is just what checks and balances exist from your point of view um, in, in in connection with um, 28-9 uh, uh, to prevent an abuse of power? Uh, in connection, you know, in, in the um, issuance of an executive order, because you could imagine a situation in which something like this, or diff, you know, is done for partisan purposes uh, or improper purposes, I suppose, hypothetically. Uh, are there are there checks and balances or do we have a, a problem in that respect? Well, the first point I would make is make is that that issue is not before the court any anymore. The it's been I know I, I, I just asked you the questions, though, yeah. so uh, if yep. you can get to it. Yeah, the 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 answer is that there are checks and balances, Your Honor, and the statute says that it has to be um, done in the interest of the public safety. So the, there has to be that rationale to to mo modify a for the governor to modify a statute to act on. Can the legislature come back and, and and reject an executive order? Of course, they could come back and they could re uh, revoke this or repeal the statute. They could. Uh, there's nothing that would stop the General Assembly from coming into session. To, to review what the governor has done. They, in fact, that's exactly what they did. They didn't revoke it. They ratified it because he okay. acted properly in their view. But the other, the other question, and I'm, I'm just hurrying, I'm rushing uh, you, I apologize, but only because of the, the time. Um, the other question is a shift of gears, uh, but it's really about police powers. You know, as I understand it anyway, um, the, the, you know, for example, there's constitutional right uh, to privacy, to property, to uh, freedom of assembly, to travel, all kinds of things that uh, can be impacted by an executive order uh, during an emergency. Uh, the governor under, under the statute can say, you can't travel, or um, I need your car and I'm taking it, uh, or you can't assemble in the way that normally we would think that uh, the First Amendment would allow. And so my question is, you know, I'm curious about why the state hasn't argued, uh, or or maybe it has, um, that we're interpreting this constitutional provision under extraordinary circumstances in the exercise of uh, emergency powers in a in a, um, a time of a pandemic. Should that affect our interpretation of the Constitution? Uh Absolutely, Your Honor, and we have we have argued that and briefed it. It's at page 15 to 19 of our brief, and we haven't had a chance to discuss it today because we've been focusing on the text. But right, those Can are you just to briefly summarize your your point there with with um, uh, you know and tell us what what cases that we should read. I know it's in your brief, but um, I I just like like to um, to hear it in a in a sentence or two. Yes, the, the police power. The, this court has recognized, and that we've cited a number of cases in our brief, and there's lots more that the. the government's police power to protect the people from um, public health and safety emergencies like this is exceptionally broad and it runs especially deep in this type of a context where there's uh, infectious disease that could affect the whole population. And it's not just this court's precedence, it's the Jacobson case from the United States Supreme Court that I think is arguably the, the most important because there the United States Supreme Court made it clear a long time ago and it's been re applied repeatedly by courts in this current pandemic that the government has the power, its, it's police powers are at their apex in this type of a situation. And that in this type of a context, even the most fundamental of constitutional rights have to give way to some extent um, to protect the public health and safety. And it would be an exceptionally bizarre result for the Supreme Court to say on the one hand that the government can restrain constitutional rights in the name of public safety, but for this court to interpret our own constitution to say that the government cannot protect those same rights for that same purpose, especially when the constitutional provision that we're talking about, Article 6, Section 7, exists for the very purpose of protecting the right to vote. It just makes no sense. 
Yes, Justice, uh, Chief Justice. The, the, the issue that I have with that statement is who is the government at any particular time? Is the executive branch or is it the legislative branch? The legislative branch can actually, um, well, and the people can directly through their constitution limit those powers, can't they? Certainly, the, the electorate can limit the, the government's uh, powers through the constitution, uh, but there, there's no constitutional limit here that has, would prohibit the uh, what the governor has did. And the legislature delegated the, its uh, police powers to the governor through 28-9B1 and has since ratified his opinion. So really the question of who had the authority is not at issue in this case, but but those powers exist and they, they in this court, they should weigh very heavily on this court's interpretation of the, of the text that we're dealing with, the purpose of which is to promote uh, the, and protect the right to vote. I, I think that's where, as the old expression is, um, that's where the rubber meets the road. That is the issue that is before us today, isn't it? Not, not which uh, branch, whether it's the governor or the legislature, because the legislature has come no, in no. and authorized. No, that there, there was a constitutional amendment. No, well, there's a constitutional provision, and that provision is what we're trying to figure out right now. What does sickness mean? Does it mean the individual? Or does it mean uh, people generally? Um, it's, uh, I believe the Texas court said there is no pandemic exception um, in Texas. Um, I, I guess the question here is, is there a pandemic exception in Connecticut? Well, it's. I agree with you that that's the question in the case. Uh, my point with regard to these, the, the police powers of the state, is that that should inform how the court interprets the constitutional text, not that it controls over the text, but it inform. It has to inform how the court interprets that text. Thank you, Mr. Scott. And unless the court has any other further questions, I would ask the court to affirm the judgment. Thank you very much, Attorney Doss. Are you ready to proceed? You're muted, sir. You're still muted. Thank you, Your Honor. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. I just did so to my own moment. Apologize. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I think what I'd come back and say is what this case is really about is whether everyone has the right to vote by absentee ballot. And under the state constitution, they can't. Our position is that healthy individuals should not be able to the mere existence of COVID the mere existence of, uh, of Ebola, the flu, the cold doesn't give rise to that. Um, in order of hands raised, it's Justice Ecker, then Justice Kahn. Just a quick question, um, uh, Mr. Doss, following up on what I asked your uh, opponent. Um, there's no claim here, you're not making a claim that there's any pretext or partisanship uh, or improper uh, motive behind the declaration of the governor. Uh, that's not part of this case, right? Or, or wrong? Well, it, well, it's inherent, Your Honor. To, to it, it's inherent in the in re opinion just of justices from 1862 decision. Because no, I'm, not, if, I'm just asking about the facts of this case. I'm not yeah. talking about general so, political purposes. Exactly. I'm and, and, saying I'm asking whether you're claiming in this case that Governor Lamont issued seven QQ in the relevant provisions here for improper political purposes. When I say improper political, I'd say improper constitutional. No, and I, I mean, no, Mr. Doss, yes. I mean partisan. Pa partisan, potentially. To help his party rather than your party. I, you know, I, we don't have evidence of that, and that's not in the record, so I'm not going to be able to make an affirmative representation that this Is helps. Is it in the complaint? Is it in the complaint? It, it's not in the complaint, but it's in okay. our brief this way, Your Honor. Um, in re opinion of justices said, the reason there's a restriction on why government officials can cha uh, shouldn't be able to change who can vote in an election by absentee ballot, and only the electorate could do that, is because they didn't want the elected officials being able to change the rules of election in the middle of the election. And that's what we do have here. These rules for an election are being changed in the middle of the election. So that, Justice Ecker, without coming out and saying that's partisan, because I can't represent that that's the case, that was the safeguard for what we have in the Constitution, and that's the violation that we're looking at. Okay, um, thanks. Justice Kahn. My, my question to you, Attorney Doss, is uh, I get your point. You're saying that by adding that exception, the COVID sickness, that basically it's allowing everyone to fill out an absentee ballot. But I don't, I have trouble with that argument because anyone really, for any reason, like Justice Ecker's example, they can go to a friend's pool party, they can go to Rhode Island for the week, 
uh, or the day uh, and decide they'd rather not vote in person and rather vote by absentee ballot. My question to you is, you seem to agree that anyone, an elderly person who uh, is afraid of of uh, being uh, affected by COVID could check off sickness, just the sickness exception because their immune system is suppressed. Um, it's based on your own individual assessment. So my question to you is, instead of a, the absentee ballots being sent out in the form they were, if there was a cover memo that said, in light of Governor Lamont's order, uh, if you are concerned about catching COVID because of your age, because of, of anything related to your condition or any condition you may have, uh, you don't you can get an absentee ballot, some sort of explanation that uh, sickness could include COVID basis. Would you be here today? Would that be OK with you? Your Honor, your we, we, yeah. So we're here today before the Connecticut Supreme Court because Judge McCausher issued a declaration answering this question. Does sickness no, but, but I know what Judge McCausher a- answered, but what I want is an answer to my question, my hypothetical. If instead of the form as it was sent, there was some memo instead of the absentee ballot as it was sent, it was sent with a memo from the Secretary of State explaining that in light of Governor Lamont's order, uh, folks can check off sickness if they're concerned because of their age or some other medical reason uh, that they don't have to disclose that they can get an absentee ballot. Would you have filed your client have filed the action? That's my question. Yeah, and and the answer is I can't speculate on that. What I can tell you is the reason we're before the Connecticut Supreme Court is because we now have a declaration that sickness applies to a general existence of COVID and not to the individual. And that's why before the Connecticut Supreme Court, I can't- I I understand that that's, uh, Attorney Doss, I understand that that's why you're before us now, but you did bring this action, correct? On behalf of your client. Correct. And so that's why you're partly in before this court is that you brought this action. In fact, the first action you brought wasn't before Judge McCausher. You brought a different uh, action, correct? That was dismissed for jurisdictional purposes. So let's leave aside Judge McCausher's decision. I understand that you your argument is you believe he was erroneous, but I still want to get back to my hypothetical uh, and I understand you don't want to, maybe it puts you in a tough position to answer that question, but I wonder if we're, what we're arguing about here is how a form was created. So your honor, you concede that someone who's afraid of catching COVID because of their age could uh, legitimately check off sickness. Your Honor, the reason the, the, the hypothetical is not one I can address because it would raise ethical implications about legal strategy of when an action will be brought and when they couldn't. And I'm not ethically allowed to speculate about that on behalf of my clients. What I'm presenting you with the, what the basis for this claim is, as well as why we're before the Connecticut Supreme Court, which is because a declaration was made that now has broad reaching effect, both in the results of the primary and the, and the general election, that Article 6, Section 7 applies to the existence of COVID and isn't tied to the individual. And that's squarely what's before the court. As far as speculating what else might have happened, if facts changed, I'm I'm simply not allowed to do that. And your honors, I'd come back to, and Justice Ecker, you talked about uh, the the authority here and and, and Jacobson versus Massachusetts. I am running out of time, so I want to be very clear about something. Jacobson versus Massachusetts is a case from 1901 that says that when the state had the power to restrict based on a, a quarantine, it had nothing to do with voting rights. And I want to be very clear about one of the worst decisions we ever heard in, when you study in law school is Buck versus Bell, which allowed for the mandatory sterilization of individuals with mis, uh, mental disabilities. The quote from the court was three generations of imbeciles were enough. The citation, the only citation in that case is Jacobson versus Massachusetts. That's the legal authority. That's simply not authority that should be applied today. You wouldn't be in good company if you supported, if, if you applied it. And finally, in conclusion, I realize I'm running out of time. I want to be very clear what this case is about, which is about voter enfranchisement. We have cited in our brief the objections that the Town Clerks Association had to the inclusion or expansion of absentee voting. 
what they said to us is five to eight percent of those ballots are not counted. If I go into a voting booth and I drop my ballot into the uh, into the machine, Your Honor, may I just take a moment to conclude? Mr. Doss, before you conclude, um, what did the fact finder say about that evidence? This was legislative history and it wasn't uh, that we presented and so there was no fact uh, factual hearing that would revive the court to address it. It's simply uh, acknowledging that there are simple policy considerations that should go in into this evaluation of whether to expand absentee voting and that's what our constitution entrusts. That's what the secretary sa state said in 2012. Is, is that before us or is it before us the question of whether this issue of uh, the judge's decision concerning sickness is correct? in the Constitution. So, Your Honor, it's before you in the context, as Your Honor alluded to, the Geisler analysis. Uh, what What is the process when you're talking about contemporary concerns? That's why we look at the legislative history to determine what is what the law of absentee balloting has been in the state of Connecticut dating back to 1933. And we had significant statements on in the legislative record explaining why we have that balance. This isn't a hyper technical issue. And, and to but, just but we also have a legislature um, almost unanimously agreeing, um, passing a bill that says, despite all that um, history, this is how the people feel right now at this moment. Well, to be very clear, they didn't interpret the Constitution. So that constitutional provision is still what applies, and that's what you're being asked that, to decide that, here. That, doesn't that cut against the argument you just made? I don't think so because I think it evaluates again what the policy concerns are on each side and for that reason we have that restriction in the state constitution and to Justice Ecker's point where's the check where's the where's the accountability it's in the state constitution the electorate took this away from the leadership they don't get to change it everything has to go through electorate and that's why the secretary went to the general assembly and said please ask the electorate to amend the constitution and only for the second time in 50 years the electorate said no we are not expanding absentee voting. Thank you. Uh, thank you. With that, we'd ask that the decision below be reversed. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you very much, Mr. Das. Um, in, in order to avoid a problem that, that we had in phase one, um, when I uh, adjourned to make my um, decision, um, when I got out of this room, um, some people lost connection to the hearing. Um, it, it, I think it was the YouTube uh, feature. Um, but I'm going to ask um, the clerk of the court if he will remain online because what we're going to do is we're going to see if we can decide this uh, quickly um, with a written opinion to follow or we're going to need more time. So we're going to adjourn to a different room, but I don't want to lose connection with this room. And I'm, I'm not sure if I'm doing a bit of overkill here um, to ask the clerk to stay online, um, but uh, we will notify the parties um, and the public. Uh, if we come up with anything as quickly as we can. OK, so we'll be in adjournment um, to conference um, and then we will be back as soon as we possibly can. Mr. Dage, if you will um, stay on and maybe the IT people can help address that issue um, about whether you have to stay on or whether we can rejoin this this room. OK. Certainly, Mr. Chief Justice, I can make myself available. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>